This is uh, Chris Sackney, the Director of Exploration Technology, Honeybee Robotics. Great, thanks, thanks, Bill. And, uh... Thank you. Um, first few slides, I'm going to tell you more about the company. So let's, uh, let's straight, go straight to the next slide, if possible. Uh, the, the company Honeybee Robotics, uh, we, we are very passionate about space exploration. Um, we have around 60 people um, spread all across the country in pretty much every single time zone in the United States. We have an office in Brooklyn, Denver, and I am actually based in Pasadena, a uh, few minutes from JPL, and we have a, quite a few contracts with NASA JPL, in, and some of them I'm going to describe in this presentation. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, we, we love space. We love space exploration, and some of those technologies find their way to terrestrial applications. But we live to, to go to Mars. Uh, Europa, as you know, there is another exciting mission going to, uh, to Europa. Uh, we also involved with lunar exploration, Venus, and so on. Um, just to give you a glimpse of, uh, of what we've done in the past, um, we developed a rock abrasion tool, which is essentially a geologist's hammer. Uh, this uh, abrading tool uh, creates a 45 millimeter diameter circle uh, that's used to uh, view the rocks by APXS, most power spectrometer, and uh, an imager. In, so, uh, in 2008, uh, we were lucky to get a contract and we went to Mars again. Uh, this time, we built ICSOL acquisition device, which is uh, essentially a scoop with, but it's not just any scoop, it has a, a drill that penetrates icy, icy soil. As you know, ice and icy soil are extremely hard, they, they're actually harder than concrete, and the goal was to capture um, some of this ice from a, from a subsurface of Mars and analyze for uh, different elements and, uh, and salts. Um, so this was the very first man-made hardware that touched extraterrestrial ice. Of course, the next, um, the next planet or, or, uh, or planetary body actually that's, that has ice would, that you would love to go to is Europa, uh, Enceladus and, and so on, but also Moon has quite a bit of ice. And recently, uh, on a curiosity, uh, we developed a dust removal tool and the sample manipulation system. Dust removal tool cleans rocks uh, so they can be analyzed by uh, instruments, and sample manipulation system sits at the heart of a sample analysis at Mars instrument, uh, sort of GCMS, that's used to um, analyze uh, elemental composition of samples um, and ions. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. We believe in uh, field exploration um, and testing of our hardware. That's why we went to pretty much every single corner of the world. Uh, most of these uh, sites are very extreme uh, for a reason. Uh, we seeking uh, analog um, locations here on Earth to test uh, planetary hardware. So Antarctica, Arctic, Greenland, where it's very cold. We're gonna go back to Greenland actually to test one of our deeper drills um, and uh, in, so instead of essentially doing everything in a lab which could be very complicated and very expensive it's actually easier to go um, to actually go to the field but at the same time you have to um, figure out whether the cost is worth the, uh, worth it uh, some of the sites that I'll show you, uh, very close to our facility, so logistically it's, it's very simple to get to, and for initial testing they they just they just enough. Field uh, field deployment is very expensive, so you have to essentially whether whether the expense is worth. It. Um, next slide, please. So let's I'll give you a quick background about drilling um, when it comes to planetary exploration. Next slide, please. Um, give you a slide. Uh, when, when you design a mission, and most of the missions that go out, they, they require a, a drilling uh, system. Uh, drill it allows you to do exploration in three dimensions. From an orbit or on the surface, if you have a rover, you are constrained to do two-dimensional um, exploration. If you really want to know what uh, what's hidden below, what's the history of the planet, 
you have to go below the surface. And the drilling or excavation system is, um, is the way to go. So um, I put this, this slide to show you um, how normally you uh, design a drilling mission or mission that requires subsurface exploration. So firstly, you have a mission goal. Uh, what is it that uh, mission requires? On the Curiosity, it was going down to six centimeters, acquire powder. On the Mars 2020, is going to be acquire a core down to like five, six centimeters. Uh, we are developing a mission for resource prospecting mission that's gonna go to the moon and requirement is, go to, is to go down to one meter. Once you have this goal, uh, then you have to look at the constraints and requirements, and they, those could be environmental, technological, and science. So environmental, like if you go to Europa, you know what's the temperature, you know you're in a hard vacuum, highly radiative environment. Uh, if you have a certain science instrument, you have to worry about contamination. Um, so everything has to be sterilized, has to go through dry heat microbial reduction, which drives your technology. Once you sort all, all this out, all your constraints requirements, only then you know what could be the possible drilling system. And there are three interrelated things. Um, bit design, uh, which is essentially the stuff that penetrates. Somehow you have to move uh, cuttings that you generate out. Uh, this is not the case when you do the melt probe because the cuttings become liquid. I'll talk about it later. And then you have to stabilize a hole. You don't want the hole that you created to collapse on you. So these three things you have to consider when in, a, in the aspects of the mission. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, and when it comes to drilling, you have, you, depending again on a mission, how much energy you have, how much power you have, um, how, how long the mission is to survive, you have to uh, decide which of the uh, drilling system you opt in. Thermal has essentially two. You can uh, literally melt something, like a melt probe, uh, or you can heat it up. Sometimes rocks break up just because you heat them up. Uh, and uh, the, the thing at play is the coefficient of thermal expansion. Some minerals expand faster than other ones and they crack. Uh, you can have a chemical um, a drilling. The, probably the simplest um, example is salt. If you add salt to ice, you create briny solution. And, uh, and so on. All right, um, next slide shows what to expect when you're drilling under, under vacuum in icy formations. If you put a lot of heat uh, into ice, and what you see in this movie is a, is a conventional drill bit drilling in the icy rock. The ice was, uh, the, the rock was perforated with, uh, with liquid water and frozen, and all this stuff is being done under, um, uh, under vacuum. When you, when you apply a lot of heat to the rock, the ice turns into vapor. The vapor essentially blows the cuttings out of the way. So this is a natural drilling fluid. In, a, in oil and gas industry, they use gas or, or liquid to bring the cuttings to the surface. Well, if you drill it in a in vacuum, in icy formation, you can just add enough heat to sublime water, and that's your natural drilling fluid, um, and makes drilling so much easier. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then, depending again how deep you want to go, but different approaches. Um, right now, there is a possibility, there is a discussion going on about uh, sending a lander together with a Clipper flyby mission from NASA. And that lander will potentially uh, land on the, on the surface of, of, Mar of, uh, of Europa and penetrate you know, to a certain depth to um, acquire a sample. And that's still in a sort of feasibility study range. But uh, on, on average, you have um, like a three different uh, a, a classes of, uh, of depths. First one is near surface, they run you know, 10 centimeters. So this is what Curiosity is doing. This is what Mars 2020 mission is going to do. One meter class allows you to go deep enough um, to capture samples that have have not been oxidized or irradiated by um, radiation. Uh, so that's something that icebreak mission to Mars is going to see. This is something that resource prospecting mission to the moon is after. 10 meter class drill um, requires a, a drilling connections. So this is what Exo, ExoMars drill is doing. It has both drill strings to allow it to drill uh, down to around two meters. And then if you want to go extremely deep, um, 
then you have to use some other method. You cannot use oil and gas method. You have to use sort of like a byline system where drill is suspended on a tether and penetrates down by its own. Um, next, next slide, please. I'm going to, uh, okay, I'll quickly run through. Uh, this is, the, the reason why I'm showing this slide is because depending on what you're after, the complexity is increasing. So on the y-axis, you have complexity. This is what engineers care about. On the x-axis, you have a uh, type of sample. This is what scientists care about. Uh, a lot of scientists would love to get more, uh, but coring, uh, or actually core break of capture, uh, ejection, pull out, and so on, is extremely robotically complex. Um, that's why complexity is very high, um, and not very much in habit. Uh, if you, the simplest mission is with the embedded sensor, right, uh, on the left-hand side. Here you can have a neutral spectrometer. Um, you just have to get subsurface, and you, you measure water concentration in, in IC formations. Um, so depending on, a, on what you're after, you have to weigh complexity versus science return. And this is, uh, this dotted line is essentially a fence where engineers and scientists meet to discuss what the mission is supposed to do. Next slide, please. Uh, there is obviously a lot of interest upon going deep on, uh, on Europa, so I'll show you some of the uh, developments that, uh, that are happening at, at Honeybee Robotics. Uh, some of them are actually being done with JPL. Next slide, please. So uh, before I go there, uh, we initially we, we did a trade study. Um, when it comes to Europa, first thing that comes to mind is a melting probe. Uh, uh, Europa is ice, so you can just take a melt probe and, uh, and penetrate kilometers below the surface. Uh, the problem with melt probes is that they require uh, literally tens of kilowatt of, uh, of energy. There are no um, RTGs, uh, radioisotope thermal generators, that can provide this kind of energy. Solar panels obviously cannot do this because you're so far away from the sun. So the only viable solution is a nuclear reactor. Well, you don't have nuclear reactors that can uh, be launched. Uh, development of a nuclear reactor is going to cost billions of dollars and, and take 10 to 20 years. So if you start developing melt probes and you forget the fact that you're not going to have the power of Europa, your mission is, uh, is not going to fly. Uh, secondly, melt probes uh, can, uh, cannot cut through salts, um, rocks, and, and soils. And the surface of Europa as you know, Europa has a salty oceans, and uh, and uh, the surface of Europa is very crusty. Uh, it's got regions that's just pure salt. Uh, melt probes cannot cut through salt. Uh, so if you land on these uh, flyers with you know full of salt, uh, you're not gonna go go anywhere. Um, the nice thing about melt probes, though, is that they're mechanically simple because you just have to heat it up and penetrates down. So you have to weigh uh, pros and cons, but the first two points, they trump the fact that mechanical systems are much more reliable uh, from, a, from a geological uncertainty standpoint. So we've been developing inchworm drilling system is essentially a sort of uh, a system that drills mechanically cuts through ice, the ice moves uh, to the top of the drill, it's compacted again, this is how you penetrate uh, down, so it's like a mold system, but works in ice. Next slide. Um, so we we decided to do this, and I already talked about uh, wireline approach. I just want to mention it that uh, we we completely disregarded the fact that you have to bring uh, on the, the this approach on the left hand side where you have. It's a conventional oil and gas approach where you bring drill strings. That's because it's, this entire system would be too heavy. So initially what we decided to do is to use a wireline approach where the drill is suspended on the tether as a first step to, um, to showing that the inchworming approach is going to work. And in this case, the anchor is at the top of this drill that's suspended on the, on the wire, and the drill bit is at the bottom. Uh, so you drill by essentially uh, drilling down, capturing cuttings, pulling out, dumping the cuttings, and going back into the same hole. Next. Uh, next slide. 
So this was our initial uh, design of, uh, of this wireline drilling system. On top, you have anchoring system. This is where you brace yourself against a borehole. Uh, just underneath, you have a linear stage which advances the drill into the ice. Then you have a drive system uh, to spin the bit. Then you have a ultrasonic system that was provided by NASA GPL uh, for precasting the drill. And then you have a um, bit that captures core samples and ice. Next slide, please. Uh, we've done a couple of tests in the lab with this wireline drill on the right hand side. And this picture also shows some other drill systems. We played with a rotary system, rotary sonic, sort of like a sonic toothbrush, but it's much bigger. Um, rotary percussive is, sits inside a vacuum chamber on the left hand side, but the vacuum chamber can uh, mimic um, atmosphere of, uh, of Mars uh, in, in literally 10 to 15 minutes. So uh, that's you know pretty, pretty nice capabilities to have. Uh, next slide, please. And this is progression of a of a drill inside a, in a lab. As you can see, the drill essentially penetrates deeper until essentially it's pretty much buried in a rock. You can't really see it. Uh, next slide. The next slide. So we went to the test, as I mentioned before, you have to weigh the expense of going to Arctic or Antarctic or Greenland versus uh, what you're trying to get out of the field campaign. Initially, we built uh, a technology and we wanted to test uh, to test it out. We want to debug it. Uh, going um, and flying somewhere to Greenland is very expensive, fifty to $100,000 if you include all the expenses required to the field. So instead, decided to drive down from from my Pasadena where we based. It's essentially a three hour drive to Borrego Springs where, it's, uh, where we have a gypsum quarry so you can come in and uh, drill as deep as you want. And it just happens that gypsum has a strength very similar to ice. So that was pretty convenient. And this test site was essentially uh, selected to test out the technology required for Europa. Next slide. And this movie shows a couple of things. Uh, anchoring system, this is where you brace yourself uh, against borehole, then this is how you advance uh, to the subsurface. The next one is a percussive system. It's ultrasonic based, it uses piezo, high frequency piezo to do percussion. Then you couple percussion with rotation and you have rotary percussive drill. Um, and uh, this is scoring. Done initial test um, in a gypsum lab to show that we do that, and this is the core. And then in 2012, we went to the gypsum quarry. And these are some of the pictures showing the setup, showing the uh, cores. And uh, as you can see, the, we deployed manually the drill, but everything else was done uh, fully autonomously. So it was uh, we went down to three meters, which is twice the depth of the twice the length of the drill itself. The drill is 1.5 meters, and we went to three meter depth but we believe it's sufficient to show that the technology actually works. Next slide. Um, this shows the final um, final depth, just over three meters. On the right-hand side, you can see the length of the drill and the length of the core that we acquired from the, uh, from the hole. Next. And the ni a nice thing about uh, this test campaign is we managed to measure penetration rate, power, energies and determine whether we need percussion or not. But just to give you an idea, we penetrated around meter per hour with around 2 to 250 watts of, of power. Uh, so this kind of power can be generated, maybe can be given to you by a couple of radioisotope thermal generators. So you don't really need to fly um, anything uh, that, uh, that doesn't exist anymore. Um, the mission is actually feasible if it's a mechanical drill. Next slide. And this shows you how much uh, energy you use per, per penetration. You're talking about around 250 watt hours per meter. And again, that's, uh, that's doable within the, uh, what RTG can provide. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, we finished that project, and now we have two very exciting projects uh, with NASA JPL. Uh, we have a, a drill at the bottom. Uh, I'm holding uh, with two of my colleagues and system engineers a part of the drill that we design right now, which has a microscope, so you can see sample at a 
uh, half a micron resolution. And uh, uh, next, our next step is actually integrate um, a deep UV Raman spectrometer that's been selected for Mars 2020 mission to Mars. We're going to repackage it uh, so it's in a small diameter, so it fits into a small diameter tube, but the length is not a problem. And we're going to go to Greenland. Uh, that's going to happen in 2017. And our next project is taking this uh, ultrasonic drill and uh, make it uh, more robust. So we're going to put uh, electronics, and embedded electronics will allow going much deeper below the surface because you don't lose a signal. Uh, you have a core break of retention uh, capabilities and pretty much full autonomy. So this project is kicking in uh, pretty much as we speak. And uh, in 2018, we're going to be going again to the uh, Borrego Springs and drill uh, probably tens of meters below the surface. Uh, so with this, uh, I'd like to open the floor to the questions. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Any questions? No. I think you answered them all. Oh, we've got one here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you said that the energy is 100 times less than for melting, but you need 150 watts to go with one meter per hour. So we need about two to three kilowatts to go with one meter per hour. But the cross-section of, of our probe, of, of the ice mold, is much larger. So I, I can't see this factor of 100. You need to, you need to consider uh, losses because it's not just nuclear reactor doesn't give you electrical energy right away. You have to, if you consider losses within a nuclear reactor and then electrical cable going down to the, to the depth, uh, that's, you know, at the end of the day, this is, uh, this is what you're going to get. Uh, if you can look at the data from a, uh, that was uh, taken during a Code Regions Research Engineering Lab, uh, deployment of melt probes in Greenland and how much kilowatts of power they needed and how fast they were penetrating. Um, if you combine all of this, you can see it's uh, it's close to you know, close to a two orders of magnitude difference. Even you know even if it's a ten uh, if it's one order of magnitude or ten times more, you're talking about you know three to ten kilowatt system. And you can't have RTG that can generate uh, this kind of uh, energy. You need nuclear reactor. Um, the RTG of Voyager provided seven kilowatts, one RTG, and you do not need it as an electric energy. You, uh, thermal energy is completely okay for a melting probe. One uh, one RTG can provide approximately like the one on a, a, on Curiosity can provide approximately one kilowatt of heat, but it's not that simple. Uh, it, it's not the heat that you can use. It has to, you know, it has to be converted into, um, uh, you know, into something more usable. And you have a lot of losses going down. So we, we did the math, and um, if you if you consider all the losses in a system, um, you'll you'll essentially end up needing needing a nuclear reactor. I mean, you can. It's a, it's a good discussion. Uh, send me email. We can uh, exchange our notes. Um, but this was our conclusion. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I will do this. Okay, thanks, Chris. That was great. Right. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Thanks.